Alex Stranger, um, how you doing, brother? Yes, sir. I'm good. Thanks for having me on, man. I'm so excited. Like this is like a literal last minute thing. Um, you know, I'm waiting till you're three hours in. I want to get you while you're super tired. So uh, I'm pumped, Shank. Thanks for having me on. Let's go. Yeah, good strategy. I like it. Uh, so Alex, uh, yeah. you're in Austin, right? I'm in Austin. Yeah, I, I drive a pedicab. I'm literally at work right now. Like I was driving to work. I saw this. Um, I was lucky with my videographer. We we're gonna maybe do some filming. Like if, if it was gonna be slow, which it's been slow all the time because we're in a dog shit economy. Um, and so you know, state has it. So we're here. We're connecting. I'm really excited to do this. Yeah, and Alex, you did the trolling of uh, Nancy Pelosi, right? Yes, I met Nancy Pelosi at the Capitol factory. I politely asked her what stocks I should buy to help close the wealth gap, and her security guard assault, assaulted me, and it was really sad. And then everybody else got really angry at me um, for asking a very basic question that I think everybody should um, know the answer to, or at the very least discuss transparently. Um, because, like, like I, I saw your segment when you talked to Anna. Um, it's a nonpartisan issue. It doesn't matter what side of the political aisle you're on. Um, politicians should not be trading stocks with with like advanced prior knowledge that the public doesn't have. Yeah, so yeah, we backed you on that one because uh, that insider trading is bullshit. We hate it. Uh, we hate it when it bull no, and I appreciate how you came. I, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but like I actually really do appreciate how you like um, shared and framed my video. Like I thought that was awesome the way you actually spoke about it. So I like I have a ton of appreciation for how you framed and shared the video. Yeah, no problem, brother. And, and so it doesn't matter if a Democrat or Republican does it. It's not right. Um, okay, Alex. So I, uh, you're right wing, right? And so you, you uh, vo you're voting Donald Trump. Well, yeah, but I mean, I think the categorization of calling me a right winger is kind of a little bit misplaced. Oh, okay, great. Um, Tell me what because, it is. Like, okay, well, I think that um, 20 years ago, or even 15 years ago, I don't think my viewpoints have on anything has have really changed all that much. Um, and I just, I'm just a guy with like similar viewpoints to what I had like 20 years ago. And I think the political compass has shifted so much that like, you know, anybody who um, criticizes and criticizes effectively the, um, I guess for lack of a better word, the, the Democrat uh, establishment is all of a sudden being labeled a right wing extremist. Yeah, so that, know, like, Alex, that's interesting because I, I kind of hear you on that. Um, but, um, but in terms of policy, it's not like the Democrats got more left wing. I mean, they, I mean, maybe maybe we're doing no, apples they've actually and oranges. More right wing, to be honest, yeah, they got Sorry, more right wing. To be honest, they've actually yeah. got no, no. They, they are Republicans in, in blue ties, right? That's that's what it is, right? And it's like you got you look at like you look at um, you know, I, I was fresh out of college when Obama got in. I was I was kind of excited. I was hyped on him. I liked Obama, right? He was so charismatic. He said all the right things. We're gonna close down Guantanamo Bay. We're gonna stop the patriarch. We're gonna stop the wiretapping. We're gonna get out of Afghanistan. We're gonna do all this stuff. And you know what he did? He did the exact opposite. And then and then um. Those eight years of, of his election bombarded us with like identity politics and like these woke platitudes that do nothing to actually um, institute or, or create any kind of real social justice. If anything, they make the divisiveness worse. Um, and then that, and then you know, fast forward to 2020. Um, now th these same people, for lack of, for lack of a better word, are just actively censoring, silencing, deplatforming anybody that's um, speaking out and criticizing some of these, some of these. Um, some of these viewpoints, regardless of whether you come at them from the left or from the right, and, and so like, you know, the the, the word right wing extremist, it's just it's it's like this pejorative that's just being thrown around willy nilly, where it's like it's losing all of its meaning, and it's losing its meaning so much to the point where now you actually have actual Nazi shank proliferating on X, and a lot of these people, like the Nick Fuentes, maybe they're not doing it directly, but they're very much implicitly endorsing Kamala Harris. Really? No. So look. Uh, yeah. No, no. Hold on. First off, Nick Fuentes uh, the other day did say he's not voting for Trump, and he said a bunch of hateful things because uh, he's going to have gays and Jews in his administration. So that's not surprising <laughs> yes. coming from a neo-Nazi. Uh, but um, so, but he definitely doesn't like Kamala Harris. I mean, and so that's he's know, not going in that doing, direction at all. He says Trump's not right wing enough. Uh, so no, that that's not fair to put on Kamala Harris at all. Uh, but but I'm I'm curious I'm, about what you're saying because there's a bunch of interesting things that you said. So you liked Obama, but he didn't deliver enough. I, I agree, I agree with that, and and I criticize him for not delivering enough. But and no, and, and that's why I appreciate you because you actually, you know, you actually speak your piece, you tell the truth, and you say things that are unpopular with your audience. You know, yeah. and, and look, I'll put it to you this way. Sorry from like interrupting. But if like the Democrat Party were like you, and actually communicated like you, um, and actually was level, you know, spoken in a way that was level to the American people, 
I would vote Democrat, but they are not. And they are becoming more and more and more distant from distance from you over the past 12 years, especially these past four, um, even more so literally like on steroids. I, I think that in order for the Democrat Party to get back to what I think it represents, which is a party of work, people, free speech, um, you know, fighting against corporatism. And yes, Trump does a lot of stuff that, that is corporatist too, but the Democrats are almost indistinguishable in, in many ways. I think that in order for the Democrats to kind of get back to their roots, the best thing to happen to them is for them to just lose in spectacular fashion. Because honestly, like, I think that you should be, you and people like you, and I'm not talking about people who have like super progressive ideas. I'm talking about people who are like just genuine, real human beings, right? And that's what you are. I saw you on Lex and I've listened to you on numerous occasions. Like, there's agreements or disagreements, but one thing I'll say is that you're a real human being. And right now it just feels as though the, the, your Democrat politicians are not real people and them losing will maybe get them back to the drawing board, do a little bit of a reset and maybe they can actually go back to what they're supposed to be doing. Yeah, I hear you and I, my God, I would love that. They almost never do resets and it's super frustrating. I mean. Well, yeah, because they keep winning, that's why. No, they lost in 2016 and I mean, and they lost to Donald Trump, who they thought was a clown and an idiot and all those things. And I think that too, but then you lost to him. So what does that make you? And even that didn't well, cause a, a reset, cut. right? So yeah, because they had a split cut. Okay. I'm yeah. sorry, I'm, I'm being like, I'm, I'm no, no, it's okay. Look, so I agree with you on the Democrats, and I'm deeply frustrated, and I wish they would reset, and they never do. I don't think losing necessarily gets them to do it. Uh, but having said all that, Alex, yes, but what's on the other side, right? So when you talk about corporate Republicans, they're not any better than corporate Democrats. In fact, they're worse, right? They've been uh, kissing up to the donors and giving them everything they want my entire lifetime. So you know, the only person that might be worse than Nancy Pelosi in, in you know, uh, placating and 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 serving donors is Mitch McConnell. So okay, so but oh, I hate Mitch McConnell. Yeah, I I I, I get, that's what I would have guessed. So I'm not surprised yeah. by that at all, right? So that leaves us with Trump. Yeah, but Trump he also does everything that his donors say, and in fact he brags about it. I mean, he he was so. against electric vehicles. Then Elon Musk gives him a lot of money, and he goes, he gave me a strong endorsement. He gave me a strong endorsement, so now I have no choice. I'm for electric vehicles. Dude, brother, you just admitted you were corrupt. Do you see what I'm okay. saying? I, I get what you're saying. And to be honest, I don't think Trump really did anything all that impressive. Like I, I saw the last guy. I, I I mean, I think by comparison, obviously, if you did like a, a, compar a comparative analysis of like how most people's quality of life was from 2016 to 20 to now, most everyday regular people had a better quality of life um, when Trump was in office. Versus now, not saying that's because of Donald Trump, but that is what it is. Um, and I think that a lot of, um, I, I think for the most part, his for his first four years, he's pretty unremarkable. But um, I'm kind of liking, and so like also, I was a Kennedy guy before all this too, right? Um, and the reason I've been kind of liking him is, you know, you're talking like you're saying a lot about how he's a corporate Republican and all this other stuff. And um, my my um, response to that is that. You know, the, the the reason I'm kind of cautiously optimistic on Trump is um, the primary reason is the fact that he's embracing Bitcoin and is talking about putting it on the balance sheet and opening up the door to um, Bitcoin mining, Bitcoin development and um, sound money. He's spoken about banning central bank um, digital currencies. You have people like, like I was a Kennedy guy, right? And, and I was going to vote for Kennedy. And what I, uh, you know, the way in which the Democrats treated Kennedy was, was like abominable, you know, like they... Um, Hillary him all throughout the media. You talked about that when you were on, on Lex's show. Um, you know, when he got the ballot signatures, I, I, I was a signature collector and I tried to help get on in Texas. They were like, the, the Democrat parties were like openly suing um, Kennedy left and right and draining his resources, denying him security up until Trump got shot. You know, it just feels as though like the way in which they're like denying the voices of third party candidates just seems like, it seems uncomfortably fascistic. From my perspective, you know? so Alex, what I'm hearing from you is like you you have reasonable points on Trump. You know, he 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 didn't do much when he was in office, and et cetera, and all the things that that you just mentioned there. And you're not denying the obvious corruption where he says to the oil companies, "Hey, give me a billion dollars, and I'll give deregulate and give me tax cuts." He says to Elon Musk, he says to so many other people, it's like it's pretty brazen. Um, so, but what I'm hearing from you is that. You just can't stand the Democrats, and and it's less of a vote 
for Trump than a vote against the Democrats. Am I hearing that right? I think in many ways, yes. Um, I do really like the fact that he is embracing Bitcoin and um, speaking out against central bank digital currencies. I really like the fact that he pardoned to, that he's promising to free Ross Albright on day one. I think that is a promise that he will keep. I think creating a strategic Bitcoin reserve will do a lot to kind of help pay off our national debt without creating hyperinflation. Um, just because if you understand Bitcoin and how it works, um, it's mathematically designed over time to drastically appreciate value because it is a scarce asset that becomes harder and harder to produce over time. I think that embracing that is going to overall be a net positive for the country. I think that another reason why I'm starting to, why, why I've been like Trump, it's for a different set of reasons, but a big reason why I'm liking Trump is because of his willingness to um, do long form interviews and do Twitter spaces. And, you know, he's going on podcasts and the podcast he's going on, these are like, he, he went on the same podcast you were on. He was on Lex's show. He just talked to Andrew Schultz. He went on the All In podcast, held his own pretty well on the All In podcast, did, you know, sounded okay. And the All In podcast with David Sachs and Shamath and, and, and Jason, um, you can say what you want about Sachs being a, a Peter Thiel guy and, and whatnot, but Jason's a pretty liberal, like hardcore Kamal supporting Democrat. And you have people of a whole multitude of different ideologies that are able to get along, coexist, and produce podcasts that is, for the most part, very informative. And Trump was willing to go on and have that, have these long form discussions. And um, I think that being able to have those long form discussions, and especially doing them on X in, in a format that's available to the public in real time, it enhances and improves democracy over time and makes people more representative within their own governments. And I don't see Kamala doing that at all. Yeah, so I'll definitely give you the media and the long form interviews because that's definitely the right strategy and the right thing to do, especially when you're running for president. We need to figure out you know, what you're up to. And so he's done that way better than Kamala Harris has. Um, but I'm gonna come back to that in a second. The strategic Bitcoin reserve, look, I don't, know much about it, but the idea that it's going to reduce the deficit, it's, I don't believe It'll it for absolutely a reduce second. The no, I don't it believe it for a read, second, Alex. Shank, Shank, read the Bitcoin standard, read the Bitcoin standard, go on, go take the orange pill, go down the Bitcoin rabbit hole, take some time to actually learn about why it's a really valuable currency. And then maybe we can revisit this discussion in a couple of years. Yeah, we got to like, revisit. Like I said, anytime you're in Austin, we can come to my podcast and we can talk about this. Yeah. Like once you've learned more about about this. Yeah, we, we can revisit. You're going to force me to get into what I view to be total nonsense. But okay, okay, I'll do it. I don't uh, think it's nonsense at all. I, yeah. I actually think it's the opposite. You know, Alex, what it sounds like to me is the uh, the folks on the left who say deficits don't matter. We can just print infinite money. Yeah, that's a wonderful, uh, you know, rain, and, and then rainbows and unicorns will uh, pop out of the- That's a terrible the, idea. Yeah, I, I think it's a terrible idea. And so, uh, and then when we say, oh, we, we go to Bitcoin and magically we uh, get rid of deficits. Ah, there's no, no chance that that's gonna happen, but okay. I think that I'll it does, I think it, it plays a role to, look, look more into it. Look more into it, um, that, that's, I don't think that that's why I came here to talk. To, yeah. to talk and go no, no, but I hear you. I hear you. But I think it's something to talk about it and learn more about. It. I got you. And, and then, I think that embracing Bitcoin is good that you're looking into the future. And I think that like a lot of, I, I think that you brought this up too um, earlier. And it's that like, you know, the the legacy media, I think, and, and even our legacy political system, it, it's a dying institution, right? Like, um, and you can kind of compare um, legacy media, the legacy political system with, with kind of, sim they're kind of similar um, in many ways, to like the Catholic Church in the 1500s, and I think that like um, Kamala Harris getting into office um, gives this antiquated, largely corrupt um, apparatus way more power than they should have, and they've been horrible with their power over the past 70 or so years. Ever since like mass television has come into the household, you know, they lie, they, they you know, lying about Vietnam. Um, Lying about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, um, making dubious statements about getting into the Persian Gulf War, just to name a few statements. You know, also just um, gaslighting people about how he responded to COVID. You know, basically saying that it came from a wet market when it's been pretty obvious that it was done from doing gain of function experiments that our tax dollars were paying for. And let me say one more thing: uh, Obama had a moratorium on gain of function research. Trump uh, let that moratorium lapse and allowed gain of function to happen. Um, yeah. While he was in office, I was critical about that during the primary. But I think that legacy media didn't highlight that or talk about it. And if anything, pilloried you and censored you and, and called you 
uh, conspiracy theorists and the right wing, you know, extremists and said all these things about it. She did a lot of basically gaslighting Shank. Um, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I'm with you, Alex. It's an institution that needs to die, is, is what I'm trying to say. And yeah. Kamala Winnie keeps this horrible thing, this horrible seven headed dragon alive longer than it needs to be because, and these people are going to do way more harm than, you know, we, they're, yeah. they're going to do way more harm than, than good. So I, I got to go to the next guest, but you're right about gain of function uh, and the whole idea that it wasn't from the Wuhan lab as it broke up, r broke out right next to the Wuhan lab was always ridiculous. Uh, and so, um, so before you go, one super quick uh, question for you. If Trump turns out to be as bad as I think he is, do you join my populist revolt against him so that we can get an actual populist leader that's gonna serve us? Yeah, sure, dude. I'm not in a cult, bro. Like, you know, like I don't worship politicians. That's ridiculous. Um good, good. good. But I don't I don't think that that's gonna happen, right? Because I think that like here's my other thing too, right? That I kind of want to like um I want to address this before we go. And I think that another reason why I um want Trump to win is because right now he like the um left views him as a as as a dictator and a boogeyman and the right views him as a savior. Big generalization, right? And I think that after four more years of Trump, you're gonna realize that he is neither and then we can actually just move on as a country. But well, I think that we're gonna probably get a split we're probably gonna get a split Congress. There's gonna be so much activism and pushback against anything that Trump does, even on his own side. He is the most criticized political figure, the most scrutinized political figure of all time. When you are that scrutinized and there's that much openness to being critical um, of a political leader, it's hard for them to become a dictator, in my opinion. And like, I've gone on right wing shows all the time. Like, I've been on like Infowars a bunch of times. Um, and and like, I, I talked to, um, did like a, like a Joe Rogan type sit down with, with the guy who like does production with them. The show's called Toxic Culture. Really good, really good guy, right? Um, and I was having a whole discussion about how the election, I don't think that the election was stolen and that it's a really bad narrative. And, it, and um, you know, that, that the only reason people think it's stolen is because it was close enough um, for that to even be talked about. And if that's the case, then you got to do a better job at um, communicating and implementing policy so that this doesn't even become a problem. So I, I agree with you, dude. Like if, if he becomes like this horrible fascistic dictator who just lies to us about everything and makes everything worse. Yeah, dude, I'm not in a cult. Like I just am cautiously optimistic about him. I think that. Um, he's not that at all. Okay, that's fair. And I, by the way, if he wins, I hope to God you're right, and that he doesn't become a dictator. He doesn't do any of those terrible things. Uh, so we'll see how it goes. Alex Trainer, thank you for joining us, brother. Thank you, all appreciate right. it. Jake, thank you so much. Um, real quick, um, if you guys want to follow me, um, watch my videos, hear, hear my commentary. Uh, my handle on X is at the Alex Stranger. Um, my handle on YouTube, the Alex Stranger. Uh, the Alex Stranger Rumble. Um, Alex Stranger, Instagram, Showtime, Alex Stranger. Um, I use a thing called no, uh, no Certs, a public private key uh, Bitcoin based social media system so that you can't be censored, deplatformed um, because you control your own keys. Um, I could uh, drop my end up at some point um, in, in the chat or in the group so y'all can follow me on that. But Shane, thank you so much. Really appreciate this. Whenever you're in Austin, please let me know. Let's connect and do a, a Petty Cat episode. All right. Sounds good. Thank you, Alex. All right. Up next, we've got Caroline Wren. Uh, she's a longtime Trump supporter. She's the founder and president of the Blue Bonnet Fundraising. She's a senior advisor for Carrie Lake Senate campaign.